I'm very keen for migration policy to take most of the burden of this. And the reason is that it avoids this situation where basically the government is trying to say where students should study. You know, potentially is freezing in time some set of nuts that they have which kind of distributes the students between the sector this is a global free market you can't run it that way it's terrible you know industry policy to basically guarantee a certain number of places to certain providers G'day and welcome to Global Horizons, and this is a very special episode. Before we get to that, though, I'm Rob Malicki. I'm coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And I'm Dirk Mulder, the founder of the Koala News, coming to you from Wajap Noongar country over in Perth, Western Australia. As everyone is well aware, it's been quite a, an amazing couple of weeks for international education in Australia. So much going on, and we're very lucky to be joined in this special episode by Andrew Norton, who, Dirk, I think is fair to say, leading thinker, commentator, legend of Australian higher Absolutely. education. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. Thank you for having me. Perhaps the place for us to start is with the Senate hearings, which have just taken place a couple of days ago in Canberra. And maybe just to get your initial thoughts, impressions about how they unfolded. And if there was anything in there that you expected, didn't expect. One good thing is that the higher education sector which is normally quite meek and mild in its relations with government, like no matter how outrageous the idea, where do I sign, is actually fighting hard over this one. So particularly from the peak groups, there were quite feisty uh, presentations and a very you know articulate, strong view presented. So that's positive. One of the things I found most surprising about the Senate inquiry hearings was that the apart from the chair, there was only one Labor senator really engaging and she was not pushing back very hard against what the witnesses were saying. And the minister himself has also been extremely quiet when he's being bashed up all over the place this week. So, you know, there are two scenarios here. One is that they're sort of planning a bit of a back down, or the other is that this is what they want. They want to be- people to believe that something big is happening to reduce the number of international students. Having said that, the way Senator Henderson, the, the liberal, the main liberal senator uh, there, was questioning, it's now clear to me that even though the opposition leader has committed to provider level caps, she thinks that course level caps are a bad idea. Senator Faruqi, the Green senator, clearly thinks caps are a bad idea altogether. So between those two things, we've got this unlikely green liberal alliance against course caps. So I would say now that those course cap ideas... Another thing that was interesting was that originally the the Senate committee was going to report by August 15, yet the witnesses were being told to provide their questions on notice by August the 20th, which suggests that unless be highly unusual to get this questions on notice content after the report had already been published. I haven't seen anything that officially says it's been delayed, but that's quite possible. I suspect the government is going to you know, try and make the sector feel a bit better by removing some of the, the course uh, content while still proceeding with the core idea, which the education provider, which is really their core political problem, which is the number of international students in Australia and how that impacts on accommodation and all these other you know, pressures on services that they've been talking about. I really think you know, the course cap idea, which and it's linked to skills, which the minister kind of backtracked even sort of shortly after it by saying it was a reserve power, but that wasn't the impression given by the policy document they released a few days before the bill went to the parliament, yeah, where the title had skills in it, and there must have been at least a dozen references to skills in the document itself. So it's gone from, you know, what seemed to be a core idea to a reserve power, possibly something you'd already moved entirely as kind of a political obstacle to the passage of other parts of the bill. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Can I take you slightly back um, or back one paragraph in terms of timelines and programming? One of the things that I found really interesting was the omission of the International Education Association, the inclusion of the Department of Home Affairs as opposed to the Department of Education in the first day's programming. Sources close to me tell me that there is a second day planned. But as you say, if they're meant to be wrapping this up on the 15th, Parliament's meant to be sitting next week. What's the likelihood of a second day of hearing? It's pretty hard to see how it's going to operate on the current schedule because usually you don't have hearings when parliament is sitting so it's too hard on the other hand as the year ticks on 
people also want certainty about what the caps are going to be, which you can't have until the legislation is passed. So there's a bit of a trade-off between these things. But particularly if there's going to be a significant redrafting of parts of the bill, then that does require time. It has to be finalised you know, in the next month, but exactly how they're going to do it, I'm not sure. It seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it? I was reading, I think it might have been in the Quattler actually, Dirk. There were comments from Department of Home Affairs and Education around just the IT systems that are going to be needed to manage caps and the like. And we all know that procurement around government IT systems is a horrendously long and complicated process. And yet there was, I think there was still a comment somewhere there saying, no, we're still expecting this to start on the 1st of January. But I don't know, just in terms of Department of Home Affairs were talking about a November release. So, I mean, that's, you know, when you, like, I agree with you in terms of timelines. I mean, there's, there's got to be work going on in the background right now in terms of project management, not in lining this stuff up because you, you can't just pump this stuff out in a matter of weeks. Like there would be, but in some ways I didn't think that point was pressed as hard as it should have been during the Senate hearing. So Senator Henderson asked about costs and the timeline, which is how we found out about the November. But I would have liked to push hard on just the feasibility of doing this at all. Because basically what we need for this to work is kind of real-time monitoring of two things. The person has a student visa, which Home Affairs knows, and whether they're actually enrolled, which education should know but possibly doesn't due to their disastrous taxi enrollment system and so the legislation actually requires these two things and that does require a whole lot of real-time information for this to work properly and the providers need this real-time information as well because they are constantly trying to manage against this very precise number that's going to be set for them oh look i think you make a great point here and given the fact that the secretary uh, himself when asked on numbers actually said that he didn't have real-time numbers even on visa data i think he had to go back to june for those figures i mean it's a really a great point you make. I do not believe this has been thought through properly. To me, it's very obvious from the submissions to the inquiry from the Department of Home Affairs, where they describe this IT issue as requiring significant development, which is euphemism for extremely hard to do. And then both the vocational regulator and the higher education regulator put in submissions expressing concerns about how this is going to work. So to me, it's quite unusual for three government departments or agencies to basically publicly say that a fourth government entity, the Department of Education, doesn't know what it's doing. You've argued quite convincingly, and including in this week's paper, International Students, a government changes its mind, and we'll drop the link to that in the show notes. You've argued that essentially the, the idea of capping students' numbers isn't necessary for the government to achieve its policy objectives. So for those people who haven't read that paper or aren't familiar with your arguments, what are you arguing just would be sufficient for them to achieve their objectives? I guess I'm a little bit cautious about saying the migration alone is completely enough. And part of the reason that even though we can see that vocational education has already been very severely affected by the migration policy, at least up until June this year, which is the latest set of numbers we've got from Home Affairs, I would say the higher education numbers are looking pretty normal overall, even though we know that some providers are in trouble. And therefore, we really need some extra data to know whether it's been enough for higher ex. So various policy changes that didn't take effect till the 1st of July. And therefore, based on June data, it's probably hard to say you know, what effect they're having, particularly the, the visa fee increase, which had no prior warning. Some of the other things had been foreshadowed. We need to watch that. But I guess I'm very keen for migration policy to take most of the burden of this. And the reason is that it avoids this situation where basically the government is trying to say where students should study, you know, potentially is freezing in time some set of nuts that they have, which kind of distributes the students between the sector. This is a global free market. You can't run it that way. It's terrible, you know, industry policy to basically guarantee a certain number of places to certain providers. It changes the whole dynamic of the sector where basically lobbying Canberra is kind of as important as doing a Friday decent service to international students. There are so many reasons why it's better to kind of slow the numbers with the migration rules, but then once they're here, you know, make up their own minds about what they want to do. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. 
Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities, from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. In terms of that distribution, in terms of, alloc- no, I don't even want to say allocation, let's just say the size and composition. Um, I think it was Sharon Pickering from Monash put forward the, the idea that a discussion through the compact disc- area would more sense. Uh, what's your thought on that? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that if it's rumoured they want to cap internationals relative to domestics, then obviously it's silly to discuss these two numbers separately from each other if they're supposed to be related. So that's the yes part. The no part is I do not like this compact idea at all. This goes back to the start of the conversation. Normally in these kind of one-to-one negotiations, in my view, the universities just capitulate to whatever the Commonwealth wants because all their CGS money depends on this agreement with the funding agreements, which the mission-based compacts would replace. So if they've got all their funding, all their public funding at stake, how much argy-bargy is there going to be over the international? Just the universities are putting themselves in a weak bargaining position. So I'm quite nervous about that idea. Kind of this relic of the compact accord, all these ideas about you know implying agreements. This is not an agreement kind of government. This is a government that tells you what to do. And I don't think they're going to be true compacts or true accords. And really, you don't want to get in this situation where it's kind of one-on-one negotiations, where you don't have a public platform, where you can kind of appeal to the parliament for some protection. Good point. Can I change tack? Peter Hendy, I think it was, made the point in the private higher ed discussion around the allocation of caps to, I guess, to that sector, noting that you know, some private higher education providers are up to 90% international, some are 100%. Have you got any sort of thoughts or, or, or had any vision on how caps may apply to that of the sector? I think it's going to be most difficult if we have this relationship with domestic students. As you just said, a lot of them either have no domestic students or relatively small numbers of domestic students. Another thing that Hendy raised, which is that other parts of the bill, which basically say you need to provide places to domestic students, I think for two years before you can apply to internationals. At the same time, to get fee help, you need to provide an education for three years. And recently approved providers have all done it by internationals first. So you've kind of got this kind of situation where you can't basically set up a provider unless it's going, the market is going to be domestic students who don't need fee help. And that's obviously a relatively small share of the market. We've also got this problem that a lot of these private providers operate as pathways to public providers. And so how do the public providers manage the inflows of those students? So they go typically into second year, if it's a diploma course, how do they manage that? These organizations are sort of so intertwined that it's actually complex to set caps entirely separately. So how is all that going to work? I'm curious, Andrew, because it feels like this opportunity for major change in higher ed comes along sort of every five to 10 years. And from my sort of gut feel from previous major changes, I know it seemed to have been a bit more organized or feels more thought through. (laughs) To me, it feels a little bit chaotic. What's your perspective on the way that this whole consultation process has unfolded since last year? It's pretty clear the whole home affairs portfolio has been in chaos for a long period of time. And, you know, as a result, the, you know, the contradictions all over the place. Like we're getting documents, you know, the the one in May basically telling us we should diversify our source markets. By the way, we're going to reject all these applications except from China and a few other countries with high rates of going home. So, you know, just straight out contradictions in what they're saying. Also, you know, we expect most people to go home, but by the way, make sure you study courses related to Australia's skill shortages. Like it's just, they can't, main, they can't maintain a consistent message. In some ways, I think what's happened, yeah, I think in some ways the home affairs and the sort of the education, the high, international division of education department are probably just victims of a cabinet level decision that international students must come down and they've just pulled every lever they can find or think of without actually thinking whether this amounts to any kind of coherent policy. It's such a good lesson, isn't it, of just how interdependent different parts of the policy space, uh, different parts of the public service and the economy, that everything is just intertwined and that you try to really make major changes to one element of it, in fact, flows through everything. I was interesting reading you know, some of the comments from the business councils in the Senate hearings. And of course, they'd be quite alarmed with the, some of the development, some of the proposals, because that would potentially really impact business. It's an observation. 
Massive higher education in Australia has actually restructured the economy at both ends of the labour market. High skill, but also providing this large pool of late teen, 20 somethings willing to do casual service type jobs. Like without international students, we would not have Uber because it is so reliant on current or former international students to drive those cars. Wouldn't have all these, you know, other delivery firms, probably, you know, all the Asian restaurants we've got around Australia would are still there. Essentially, it's, 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 the, it's the, gig, the full, full gig economy, right? Yeah, exactly. And so we kind of got a taste of this during, you know, the COVID lockdowns where suddenly occupations traditionally have yeah, been oversupplied to the point where, you know, you could easily charge, easily pay less than, the award rates are suddenly scrambling for stuff, totally changing the, the dynamic. So well, I guess b- before we wrap up, just in terms of, I guess, a final question, what? how do you see things moving from here? If you had a crystal ball and you looked over the next 12 months, obviously we've got an election coming up in play, most likely now early next year, given the fact that the Reserve Bank has held interest rates. I mean, I, there's probably three or four different ways this could go over the next 12 months, but what do you think? I think the bill will pass in some form, probably without the course caps. I expect there will be utter chaos in sort of late this year, early next year, as international students seek to enter the country. If we get to the point where we are, or the providers are having to cancel offers and enrolments to stay within the cap, I think there is potential this to turn into a diplomatic issue in the source countries where their their students have applied in good faith and sometimes paid money in good faith are being treated in an appalling way. So I really think this will be an ongoing headache politically for the government. Maybe once the election is passed, they can kind of have a review and decide that it needs to be changed. But I think we're in for a pretty rough, you know, 12 months or so at least. I've got one last question, similar sort of vein. I mean, we, we're seeing visa approval rates are already way down. I mean, the, the actual bodies coming into the country are, is in decline. Do you feel this is going to hit the real economy between now and the election? I'm just wondering how much of an election issue this might become from an economic, purely economic terms. And I know we want to be careful about framing this as only as an economic matter. I suspect it won't be massive in that time frame. And the reason for that is that even though the vocational numbers are well down for this year. They're quite healthy for last year and higher rates still pretty normal. So it is still quite possible that we will have a fairly high number of international students by historical standards in the country in first half of 2025. It'll take longer for the numbers to start moving down, even though clearly we'll have, with a smaller commencing cohort, we'll be on the way to doing that. Our guest has been Professor Andrew Norton, who is Professor in Practice of Higher Education Policy at the ANU. And once again, I think Australia's top thinker on higher education policy. And we're very grateful for your time, Andrew, joining us on Global Horizons. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.